have a scenario gentleman uh, making $3,920 a month. I believe he drives trucks. Um, his expenses are $3,236.96. His debt, not a lot. $13,939.59. Cash flow, $683.04. We are in the state of Texas. So we have a personal line of credit unsecured with Texas Federal Credit Union, I believe. I forgot. Um, for $14,950. The max with that specific bank uh, was 15000 and he got a 12% interest rate. All right. His goal is to pay off all his debt, establish a high cash value life insurance policy, 10x his income, um, build his business, invest in real estate. You know, we all have very similar goals, guys, right? So let's see. In his numbers, he is currently saving 2000 a month. So even after his um, expenses go out, I believe the way he calculated it was like his expenses, this is perfect when people do this, is he factored in saving as an expense. So he's saving 2000 a month, so it's included in here in his expenses. So what happens is even after saving 2000 a month, he still has an additional $683.04 that goes nowhere, okay? So he's saving 2K a month. So that's the first thing. And then we currently have $4,000 cash on hand. So that's another key thing to understand. So we're looking to fund a policy by February. Now, the reason why we are considering looking at opening up a high cash value policy is he does meet some of the factors in terms of has a debt tool, we have some capital, we do have okay cash flow. I mean, technically when you look at it, his cash flow is 2,683 a month, right? So he's got good cash flow, very low debt, and has plans of uh, increasing his income, which I believe he is going to go from making just under four grand a month to bringing in about 20K plus on the conservative side. So there is potential to earn a lot more, um, but that is something very key to point out. And I believe that will come for him April, maybe May, 2020. So that's what we're looking at in terms of growing his income. This is from uh, his, his coming business that he's building up. He's got this truck that he's looking at that he needs to purchase. And the down payment is gonna be 15,000, okay? 15,000 for a down payment on a truck that I believe will be financed at 70K. So $15,000 down payment for a truck, and I think it's a $70,000 truck. And I believe the payments will be 1,000 a month. I believe that's what we were looking at originally, okay? Planning on getting the truck, so we're gonna get this truck in April 2020. So he needs to have 15,000 cash come April 2020. Should his income jump, I mean, we're definitely gonna have that, right? Spoke to this gentleman, I think on January 6 or 7, and we're gonna have 
683.04 plus 2,000 for the month of January. And then let's just calculate February, March, April. So I'm going to have all that savings plus cash flow. And then I also have this line of credit that I can use. So what I was thinking was instead of saving up money to buy a car and then have that money never come back to me, I lose it, right? So if I was to just save up the 2000 a month plus the 683.04 for the next three, four months until I put a down payment on the truck, I should have about 15K, all right? I mean, let's do the math, let's see. He's got 4K on hand, right? Uh, January, February, March, April. So two times four, that's 8,000. 8,000 plus 4,000 cash on hand, that's 12,000. And then do 683. 683 times four months, that's $2,732.16 plus $12,000. He has $14,732.16, okay? So he'll have the 15K to put a down payment on the truck, and then every month thereafter, his his savings capability would go down by a thousand, but because of his income jumping, we won't even factor that in. It won't, it'll be non-existent. It'll just be, his expenses will go to 4,000 to 36.96. In fact, he might change his savings game and increase it quite a bit. So that's one way of doing it, right? I can just save up the money now so I can get this truck so that he can position himself to make that big money because I believe he needs the truck to make that kind of money. I believe that's how that is gonna work for him in his trucking business. So that's one way of doing it. He'll still have this debt, so we, we're basically ignoring the debt, right? To get that truck, acquire it, make the money, and then make basically like in two, three months, pay off the whole thing. That's one way. Simple, right? No, no, no arguments there. But the money is gone. I lose that 15k, right, that I saved up. How do I acquire an asset? In his case, this truck is going to be a, a very high uh, valuable asset for him. So how do I acquire something, pay for it, but also keep the money in return. So we're going to use that same, the same numbers, that 14,000 that I'm going to accumulate over the course of a certain time period. And then we have this line of credit. So $14,950 times 66% is $9,867. Okay. So we can leverage our existing personal line of credit up to this number is what I normally would do. I don't like to over leverage myself. So 9,867 is one number. I have 4,000 cash on hand. I'm going to have 2,000 at the end of this month saving, right? And then 683. Okay, so let's add that up. 9,867 plus 4,000 plus 2,000 plus 683.04. So that's 16,550 dollars. Four cents. That's one number. This gentleman is also looking at acquiring another line of credit with Wells Fargo. 
been banking with them for quite some time. So he's looking at obtaining, I believe, a 20 to 25,000. He's got very good credit. So I believe he has a good chance of getting that. If I had a $25,000 line of credit to work with, then I would ignore my smaller line of credit. No sense in borrowing from that when I have more capital and potentially a lower interest rate because the higher you go with these credit lines, typically the lower the interest rate is. And I believe with Wells Fargo, 20 to 25K, I've seen rates between nine and 11% throughout the United States um, and possibly even less than that. So if I had $25,000 line of credit times that by 66%, that's $16,500. If I had 20,000 times that by 66%, that's 13,200. Okay. So you can just take one of these two numbers and add it to the four, the two, and the 683, and let's see what we get. So I'll start with the lower number, 13,200 plus 4,000 cash on hand plus 2,000 I'm going to have at the end of January of this month plus 683.04 puts me at 19,000. 883.04. Okay. And then the other one, 16.5 plus 4,000 plus 2,000 plus 683.04. 23,000. 183.04. Now you're like, okay, why is Denzel putting all these weird numbers? Well, let's put it together now. So looking at the infinite banking concept, right? I, I asked you the question earlier, how can I acquire something, pay for it, and keep all that money, never lose it, and have the ability to use it again in the future? So basically what I'm doing here is I'm making my money usable more than once. Instead of just saving it up and using it, I'm doing something where I'm going to put it somewhere where I have the ability to take from it and keep it. I can just, I can make $1 two. I can make $2 four. How is that possible? Let's put it together. Okay. So looking at the infinite banking concept, we're talking about whole life insurance with cash value, with the ability to earn money tax-free, use money tax-free via policy loans. Look at my illustration here that I designed for my friend. So we went ahead and put a policy together. This is whole life with a life insurance company called Guardian Life Insurance Company of America, I believe. Putting in 40,000 a year. That's the number that we came up with. Why did I come up with that number? That was from the client pretty much. That was what he would like to do. Um, if you take into consideration saving 2,000 a month times 12, it's 24,000. Then we factored in, okay, if we were debt free, how much more cash flow would we have? And that put us up into the neighborhood of 30, 35K. And I was like, eh, round it up, call it 40. And that's conservative without even factoring in what I could be making for the rest of 2020 after April or May, right? 20,000 a month, he'll easily fund that. So when we're saying that we're gonna fund 40K a year, we're asking for the ability to do that. So that's gonna be my max number, 40,000. With that being said, if my policy is designed properly for the infinite banking concept, then my premium my cost of life insurance, right? cost of life insurance should be no more than $4,000 if I want the ability to put in 40, okay? So it should be no more than that. So this 
would be what's called a 90-10 split or 10-90 split, meaning 90% of the 40,000 would go towards the cash value. Right. And the other 10% goes towards the premium. If you get a policy designed like that, you're going to outperform majority of other policies, other designs that are out there, period. Because you have all the money you possibly can according to the IRS limitations. You've hit the max. Okay, so That's the max that you can go. So his starting cash value will be somewhere in the neighborhood of $35,000. So first question that pops up is, wait a minute, put 40 k in and you're telling me 4000 goes towards the premium, that's my cost of life insurance, well 40,000 minus four is 36,000. So shouldn't I have 36,000 in cash value? No, why? Because we have some other cost included. So this is just the cost of my whole life. Now, most people know that whole life insurance is like the most expensive type of life insurance that you can buy, okay? Because you're covering yourself for your whole life. So when you're looking at life insurance, understand that whole life policies will charge you, will overcharge you in the beginning years. And then in the later years, it starts to go down. With term life, it's opposite. Term life insurance is super cheap in the beginning, super expensive in the end when you actually need it. Right? So it makes you think, huh, what should I do? Well, what if you could have the best of both worlds? Taking a look at infinite banking, if I'm designing a policy to maximize cash, minimize cost, so I'm lowering my cost of life insurance up front as much as I possibly can for the most amount of cash value I can possibly get in order for me to actually do that. In order for me to actually get in $40,000 a year into a policy, I have to have term life. I have to have a bigger death benefit, okay? So for this particular case, a 29-year-old male, so 29-year-old male, the cost of whole life insurance for him for $4,000 is coming up as $352,941, okay? Now, if you were to put $4,000 a year, your annual expense, in a term life insurance policy, you would get like way more death benefit. Way, 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 way more. Why? Because term life is cheaper than whole life. Another reason why is term life insurance policies typically expire before the person dies. So the risk to the insurance company is like damn near zero. There's a statistic that I read one time in many different articles about like term life insurance policies in general over like all the insurance companies in America about, I think it was like, I saw a number 2%, it maybe it could be a little higher, but probably no more than 10. I would say maybe two to 5% of term life insurance policies actually even pay out to the beneficiary. Why? Because the thing expired. It died before the person actually died because they thought, oh, let me get the cheapest life insurance I can now while I'm young and then I don't know, maybe I'll be rich when I'm older. And the majority of people, that is not the case, okay? So when we're doing it this way, we're actually getting, we're gonna get the best, the best of both worlds. So, so far, we got $4,000, that's buying me $352,941 of death benefit, whole life. The other 
36,000 from the 40K is going to purchase me cash value, right? Life insurance, right? Cash value uh, uh, account. And it's also going to get me term life. So his term life is going to purchase him. Let me see what the number is there. $442. So for a 29 year old male, $442 and 73 cents a year. Right? This is one year. In other words, it's called OYT, one year term life insurance. $442.73 will buy him $1,447,059 of death benefit. So you're like, damn, that's really cheap. Would you agree? Sure. $4,000 only got me $352. $442.73 got me $1,447,059. <clears throat> the reason why we need to have this in our design here is so he can actually overfund the policy itself, right? So in addition to this 1.44 million, oh, you know what? I made a mistake. It's actually 1.2 million. So $442.73 buys me 1,229,000, not much of a difference, $814. And then this cash value is also going to get me more death benefit, which is where I got that 1.44 from. So let me see, 1,447,059 minus 1,229,814. So $217.245. So we have $36,000 now that goes into his what's called PUA, paid up additions. I'm paying up my life insurance ahead of time. Watch this, right? Dealing with whole life. I'm overfunding the policy in the beginning years. So I'm getting past the cost of life insurance by simply overfunding it ahead of time for a period of time so that I can benefit from having all of this death benefit and this death benefit and not actually have to pay for it when I get older, when I actually need it. Hmm, this is pretty cool. So 40,000 goes in. 4,000 went towards life insurance expense, got me 352,941. Another 442,73 from the 40K buys me 1.2 million of death benefit. 36,000 went into PUA. Of that 36, you minus 442,73, right? And then the actual uh, PUA, the, the money that went into cash value, also purchases me more death benefit. So it gets me another $217,245 of death benefit. So his total death benefit will be $1.8 million to start. All right, and that's if he puts this policy in place somewhere around February 2020. It could be like the middle towards the end, I would assume, because I'm sure he's going to want to also include cash flow gains for the month of February, and that'll increase these numbers right here. 
So, so far, we're saying to the insurance company, I want to put in 40, right? But I have anywhere from 16 to 23 to work with by February 2020 to start this policy. So I don't actually have all the 40K, which is fine. The way this would work is he would put an initial amount to fund the policy with. Whatever that initial amount is, 4,000 will go towards the cost of life insurance. And then the rest would go towards the PUA. And he'll have a lower death benefit to start with. So the max in one year for him will be uh, starting out at 1.8 million. So I wanted to break down the cost. And the strategy here is I'm using my existing money that I'm saving. I'm using the bank's money, leveraging that debt, right? On top of having debt, I'm leveraging more debt and saving money. And I'm putting it in a better account Right, so I'm putting it in here so that I can get an asset, one, right, which is be the, the death benefit, which we don't really care about right now. 29 years old, doesn't have children, doesn't have a family yet. We could care less. I could care less about death benefit. Even my uh, 50, 60 year olds that are doing this, we care less about the death benefit, more about what we're going to do with the money. Right, so money gets shifted in here. I get the asset. Now I have cash value. This cash value functions like a line of credit. It will perform like a line of credit. I'll have the ability to take money out and put money in whenever I please. Okay, it's a bit of a longer process, right? It takes time to actually get your money, it takes a few days to actually borrow the money and then it takes a few days for the money to actually hit the account and register and all that good stuff right so from if you were comparing a line of credit from a cash value account the line of credit will uh, work faster for you which is why I like having that in the first place so when I'm doing velocity banking and infinite banking together typically I'm using the bank's money to form my own bank so that later down the road, I never have to use them. I never have to borrow money. I can borrow money from myself at zero. The primary goal of Velocity Banking is not only to pay off debt at a faster rate than Debt Snowball or Debt Avalanche, but on top of that, we want to have the ability and the, the knowledge to actually use that money over and over again for other things, such as acquiring assets, building wealth, building a kingdom. Let's say for this gentleman here, these were the numbers, right, that we were coming up with. Now he is projecting, person on the board here, he is projecting to have uh, 22,000 to work with to initially fund the policy, what we have ironed out here. So coming back to, I don't think I ever answered the question why the cash value was less. It's because some money went towards term life insurance. And then there's something called a PUA fee. It's 5% of what I put in, right? So then at the end of the year, so this is including what I earned in dividends for a whole year, his cash value should be at 35000 He'll probably start with, like when he initially funds the policy, he won't have 35000 to work with because we're only putting in twenty two. Makes sense? So he's going to put twenty two in. 4000 will go towards the premium. Okay? So that leaves me with 18000 And then however much term life insurance I need to cover the amount, the extra 18,000 that I overfunded the policy with. So it'll be less than 442, maybe half, right? Because 22 is basically a little over half of 40K. 
So you can cut that number in half and then we can cut the PUA expense fee in half. So if, if I'm gonna have 35K to start with, then that was 4,000 in cost of life insurance and then like another uh, 1,000 plus in the term life insurance and then the PUA fee. So let's just minus 1,000 just to be conservative. And we could safely say that he'll have about 17K in cash value or less to start with. However much cash value I have to start with, I can borrow, what is it, 90 to 95%. I know it changes with different companies, but I believe with Guardian it's either 90 or 95, I forget. So I'm gonna go with the 90 number. So. If I have 17K starting, 17,000 times 90% is 15,300. So maybe I have 15,300 to actually leverage, to borrow from. Okay. So in this case so far, I'm in February 2020. I fund the policy, I throw 22,000 in. I got 15 plus K to work with. I don't need to buy the truck just yet. That is the goal. I don't need to, I don't need to buy it just yet, right? Now I'm in debt on whatever I borrowed, whether it was from the first line of credit or the second one. Okay? So whether or not he uses the first one or the second one. He is for sure projecting to have 22,000. And I did tell him, I'm like, look, if 22,000, that's the primary number, you could go a little higher on your chunk. 14,950, that's all I had to work with. Maybe I do a, maybe I do an 11K chunk, you know, or whatever the case may be. Um, Let's also factor in that in February, he'll have, like at the end, he'll have another 2K and another 683.04 to work with. Um, so <clears throat> if I got the 25K line of credit, then I don't have to worry. I borrow 16.5 and then four and two and 683 was capital. In addition to the 16.5, all goes into the policy. Yeah, so if I got 15,000 to work with, the first thing that I mentioned was in his case, I was like, look, we could actually pay off a debt before we actually get to the truck. We could, watch this. So he has three debts that total up to the 13,000, uh, 939.59 that we see, right? So he has, he has an existing car for, got a car, $6,244.02. And the monthly payment is $346.89. And I don't have the interest rate. It's probably like five or 6%, I forget. He has another debt. The credit card, $5,523.87. And the monthly payment's $46. And then he has student loan, $2,032.70. Okay. And the monthly payment is $108.99. So the first thing that came to my mind when I'm looking at these debts and I'm like, hmm, okay. Got 15,300 to work with. I just borrowed all this money from a line of credit. 66%, I used all my capital that I had on hand. Started this asset, got this 15K to work with. I said, hey, I think you should borrow the 6,244.02 which would be less 
come February, he has to pay January's payment. So that balance will go less. So I just, for argument's sake, I'm just going to, you know, keep the number the same. Keep it simple. 6,244.02 or less, I borrow policy loan. So I take out a policy loan for $6,244.02, right? Now here's the fun part of how this borrowing game works, right? So I have cash value of say the 15,300, no, I'm sorry. The, the total cash value is gonna be 17, right? But I, but I can only borrow 90 to 95%. So I'm gonna put 17 on this side, 17K. And then we have a policy loan for $6,244.02. And on the other hand, we also have debt on PLOC, on the personal line of credit of whatever he chunked, whether it was 16K, 13K, the nine, maybe he had, maybe he has more cash flow to work with. Um, maybe he has other funds that he can tap into. I don't know, but we know that I'm just working with the 22K example here. So debt on the PLOC, let's just say from the 22,000, if that was a number, I know for sure I've got 4K in capital. I have 2K for the end of January and then 683.04. So maybe he borrows the max from the numbers that we have on the board here, $15,316.96 from the line of credit. So in order for this number to actually be true, he would have to get the higher line of credit, get approved in the next couple weeks, 20 to 25K. If this is not the number, then we know for certain that, you know, on the low end, at least 10, the 9,867. So I'm just going to put anywhere between 9,867 and $15,316.96 is what he would borrow from the line of credit to actually be able to hit that 22K number. The only reason why the number would go lower is if he has more existing cash capital, right? So if we wait till maybe the end of February, right? Or to fund the policy, just depends on how it all works out. But just know that he is going to have debt on the line of credit. So we are going to be paying what? Interest, right? Because we borrowed money to fund our own asset. Okay, so you have that. Over here, we have the 17K in cash value, and I got $6,244.02. When I borrow from Guardian, the, let me see, the, the interest rate is 6%. Okay, so we're going to have 6% owed that the insurance company is going to be charging me on the money that I put in there, All right? So 6%, but they're also going to be crediting me 6%. So they're going to be, they're going to be charging me 6%, but they're also going to credit me 6% on whatever money I have borrowed, the 6,244.02. So 6,244.02 times 6% is $374.64. That's how much I should get charged and that's how much I'll earn 
on that money. Over here, 17,000 minus 6,244.02 is $10,755.98. So the current dividend rate for Guardian was 5.8. 85% and I believe it dropped to 5.6. I think it I think it went down to 5.65% or 5.6 for 2020. I don't remember. <clears throat> but I'm going to use 5.5. So the $10,755.98 will earn 5.5%. So $591.57. Okay. The way this works is with whole life insurance, the guardian, the guaranteed uh, rate of return is 4%. Anything above 4%, so 4% is your floor. Anything above that, they classify that as a dividend. So we're getting 4% plus a dividend of 1.5% or 1%, whatever they give us at the end of 2020. So 591.57, I'll be earning on the money I did not borrow. The money I did borrow is actually gonna be earning a little bit more than the actual dividend rate. So we got 591.57 plus 374, 64. So that puts me at uh, 900, and $66.21. So even though I borrowed this money, and when I borrow it, what am I doing? I'm gonna pay off that debt and get a cash flow gain of $346.89. So March, April, $346.89 times two, $693. 78, right? So I'll have an extra 693.78. Perfect. For paying off that specific debt. And then at this point, I'm not going to pay this back. I'm going to leave this alone. So that 6,24402 will be an outstanding policy loan on this policy that he starts. I still have $10,755.98 to work with, right? That I can borrow from, sure. For the month of February, March, April, and maybe May, I do velocity banking on the line of credit, right? So 3,920 goes in, okay? 3,920 goes in. Uh, my new expenses are now, let's see, $3,236.96 minus $346.89. So my new expense number per month should be $2,897. So here's what's going in. Here's what's coming out of the line of credit. And then you get your, you know, whatever your remaining balance is at the end of February going into March. Okay. So if I borrowed 15,000, let me just go with the high number, 15,316.96 minus income 3,920 plus 2,890.07 expenses balance at the end of that month on the higher line of credit would be $14,330 maybe. Whatever the interest rate is, maybe he gets like a 10% rate. Won't be too far away from the 12. And then I do velocity banking. But see now, we're no longer going to save 2K a month, right? We're not doing that anymore. So because I'm not saving money anymore, that means his expenses 
the money that's actually coming out of the line of credit will be a lot less. So let's correct ourselves here. Remember how I was saying earlier that he factored in the expenses uh, of, he, he counted his saving as an expense. So 3,920, uh, okay, 3,236, 96 minus 2,000, because I no longer have that minus the 346.89. So $890.07. I believe he lives at home, which is why his expenses are super low. So let's just say a thousand. I have 890. I'm gonna overestimate and say his doubt his expenses will be a thousand. Thousand bucks. Right? And and that's money that will be coming out of the line of credit. If I'm no longer saving money in a separate account, in a savings account, because I'm doing velocity banking, then I keep that 2K, I keep it in here. I keep it in the line of credit. So whether he is making 3,920 a month, or maybe he was making 5,920 a month, and then pretending like he's making 3,920, whatever it is, however it works for him, all of his income on a monthly basis will be going into the line of credit after we fund the policy and after we borrowed from it as well. I'm not paying into the policy. My policy is paid for the whole year. I don't have to pay into it. Everything I did above the 4K is over funding. We're doing velocity banking over here. Here's the primary focus now. Primary focus is to bring this debt to zero balance or close to it as fast as possible. So I have February, March, and let's say April, okay? Just by going, just by going by the cash flow, right? 2000 plus the original 683.04 plus the 346.89, March and April would equal $6,059 and 86 cents. Okay? So cash flow $6,059.86 for sure is what the line of credit would drop by however however much I originally borrowed. So if I borrow 15,316.96, I have a guarantee that the balance will be $6,059.86 less. Does that make sense? Doing velocity banking, all my income goes in, expenses come out, cash flow stays in. The cash flow, 100% of that stays as principal because I dumped all my income in. So I don't get charged interest on the money I put in, only what I'm taking out, okay? Which in this case would be the, uh, the expenses and then the existing debt that we borrowed originally, okay? So with that being said, remember, the other primary goal in order to boost my income come April, May of 2020 is I got to put 15K down on a truck. So whatever the balance is on the line of credit, we don't actually care. Okay. For sure. Look, 15,316.96 minus 6,059.86. So end of April going into May my balance on the line of credit if I borrowed 15K plus will be somewhere around 9,000 or less. And if I had a $25,000 line of credit, remember how I said 16.5? 16.5 would be the chunk number. So let's see, 16.5 minus 9,000, I've got 7,500 of space to chunk. Yes, would you agree? Of course, right? And then if it's less, if the original number that I borrowed to initially fund the policy is less, then obviously the balance on the line of credit would be less as well. And with that being said, my second chunk, so my first chunk was to fund the policy. My second chunk will fund the policy again 
but now we're not going to pay this back. What we're going to do is we're going to add more money to the principal cash value to try to hit 40K. Get it? And when I do that, I'll have more cash value to work with than if I was to just pay myself back the 6,244.02. Because even though I have 6,244.02 outstanding in when I log into my life insurance account and I go on the desktop and I log into the portal, it'll show 17,000 in cash value. What's available to use? 10,000. But what I have is 17. The insurance company did a collateral loan. They gave me their 6,244.02 and they used my cash value as collateral and they charged me interest on their money and then they paid me interest on my money and it offset my borrowing cost over there. My only borrowing cost is over here on the line of credit. I offset that borrowing cost on the line of credit. Why? Because I paid off the car and I got a cash flow gain and saved interest over there. So I removed that institution off his credit report and I put it over here so he can pay himself back the 6,244.02 from the 346.89 and he keeps all his money in the process and debt gets paid off and I save money on interest and I increase my cash flow. I'm on a roll, okay? I'm getting hot now, ready? So second chunk, whatever the number is, we know for a fact it's going to be more than 6,059.86, right? Let's just say I did that, 6,059.86, add it to the 17, 17 plus 6,059.86. So his new cash value will be somewhere around 23K, give or take. That's very, very conservative. From what's, av what's available though, would be the 10,755.98 plus 6,059.86. So $16,815.84 is what I would have beginning of May to put a down payment on that truck. Now, I'm not just going to chunk my cash flow. We don't do that in Velocity. We don't just chunk cash flow, it doesn't make sense. So we need to chunk a little bit more. So remember how I was saying that uh, 7,500 was one number. So I can probably chunk anywhere between 7,500 and maybe 12K, right? We don't mind. We don't mind having a debt over here because, about, because of what we're about to get into, okay? So come April or May of 2020, I'll make a second chunk of somewhere around this number no less than 75, maybe more than 12, but we'll see. It depends on how fast he moves, how, how much he knocks down on the line of credit. Remember, I don't want to breach 66% too much. Maybe I go to 75, but I don't want to go 90 and up. Okay, I don't want to almost max it out. I like to keep a nice uh, a space in there, right? So second chunk goes in there, boom. Now... I have the money, so it'll be 23, maybe it'll have like between 23 and 27K cash value to actually work with. He initially put in 22,000. If he adds another 10, let's say, that means he's put in a total of 32, and then anywhere between 23 and 27 um, or more shows up in cash value. I'll have the ability to take another policy loan for 15K and then put a down payment, bum, buy the truck. Have the $1,000 payment, whatever it is. Cash flow will go down a thousand bucks maybe the first month, but once he's got that truck on the road and he goes a full 30 days, boom, here's what we're looking at 20,000. Right? Once I jump to $20,000, 
maybe his take home from that's I don't know, 15 or maybe less uh, net, whatever the number is, it's going to be way more than 3,920. Would you agree? Of course. So now I've got all of June, July, August, September, October, November, December. I got seven months to do velocity banking on the line of credit to bring it back to zero. And then I have time to also restore the policy loans by the anniversary date, February 2021, and max fund the policy. I'll have the ability to do that, no issue, right? And then when I step into the, uh, the, the 2021, then I fund another 40K, and this becomes his savings account, his tax-free savings account that's going to earn him anywhere in the neighborhood of 4 to maybe 6% tax-free for the rest of his life. He funds it for a certain period of time, maybe 7 years, maybe 10, maybe 15, maybe 20. After I'm done funding the policy, we will turn it into a reduced paid up RPU. Reduced paid up, which means that He'll no longer pay this and he'll own his death benefit. He'll own it. It'll all be his, which he never has to pay for again. So unlike term life insurance being cheap in the beginning, super expensive at the end, whole life being expensive in the beginning and having to pay it your whole life and it gets you know, less and less expensive over the years, we get the best of both worlds where we have both in the beginning for the m minimum amount of cost possible for the max amount of cash value usage now. I get to use the money now while I'm alive. I get to use it now, use it now, use it now. And then I own it, never have to uh, pay another dollar into the life insurance again. So according to the illustration that I'm looking at, after... So I have it designed where he puts uh, 40000 for seven years. So that would be a total of 280000 in principal that went in, right? Principal money that went in. His cash value will be somewhere in the neighborhood of 300,000, okay? And then what happens is once you're done funding the policy, the term life insurance will fall off, okay? Every year, the cost of your term life will drop little by little because you're paying up most of the death benefit in the beginning years with the 40,000. So what happens is when we get rid of the term life insurance expense, his death benefit will drop a little bit. Again, we don't care about the death benefit. So his death benefit will drop to somewhere around 1.5 million and he'll be 35, 36 years old. $1.5 million death benefit doesn't cost him a dime for the 1.5 and he'll have a line of credit for 300K which he can purchase real estate with, which he can fund his business further and 10x his income, whatever he so pleases, okay? Now, here's what happens. Throughout the years, that cash value has to earn interest and dividends and interest and dividends, okay? So, what happens when this number rises? The death benefit has to rise as well to avoid what's called a MEC, a modified endowment contract. So when he, from age 36, right? So he'll be 36 right here, 36, 37, whatever it is. He'll have 1.5 million 300K when he turns retirement age is 59 and a half. When he's 59 and a half, his death benefit at 59 will be back at the 1.8 million. This is super cool. And then let's say 
This guy lives to be a nice old man, grows old to the age of 90 years old. At 90 years old, he'll, let's say he passes at 90, right? Uh, he'll, be, he'll have a death benefit of 2.7 million. So at 90 years of age, 2.7 million. Let's say he this let's say he lives to be 100 because with all the science and all the technology upgrades and the way this world's moving super fast people are living longer hey I don't see 100 being that hard of a number to get to right in terms of the times that we're living in right now so let's say he lives to be 100 years old his death benefit would be in the neighborhood of 3.2 million, right? 3.2 million. For my math people, what is the return on investment if I put 280 in and got 3.2 million back or I put 280 in and I got 1.5 back, right? Let's, let's say I max funded the policy for seven years and I pass away. Would that have been a bad thing? Shoot, I put 280 in, you're gonna give me 1.5 back to my family? That's pretty awesome. Plus, during that seven years, I basically had the opportunity to use the same money to create more wealth, right? Create more wealth. It all started with that 15K down payment on the truck. And we managed to pay off debt. So notice how if I would have went the simple route in the beginning, just save the money up, buy the truck, that's all you would do. But in this case, I would have done the same exact thing with the same exact money, except I had an advantage. I had a line of credit that I borrowed from, I established an asset, I actually paid off debt, increased cash flow, almost max fund a policy, and I kept all the money in the process. I kept the bank's money, now it's my bank, now it's my own money, all right? I kept it all for myself, right? So. <clears throat> That's pretty powerful. Any questions on that?